，然后他是一个新呃新闻工作者。那他曾经因为他写的新闻，让某些政治人物或者是议员就就被关起来了。哦，所以他是一个蛮有影响力的这个 investigative journalist。那他在过去几年都在推广这个使用新科技在新闻室里面，怎么样让媒体用新的科技、用新的做法？好，那最近得到一笔盖茨基金会一点五亿台币的 funding 来做更多这样的事情，推广出非洲大陆。好，那我们就请他来分享，谢谢。Hi, so my name is my name is Justin. Hi, my name is Justin. Um, I'm a journalist, but what we do is we use data and technology to empower citizens, like it says on the screen. We've got seven technology labs where people like this work across Africa, and um, what we try and do is we try and do exactly the opposite of what an organization in America called Code for America um, does. Um, although we called Code for Africa, we do the polar opposite, and what we do is we try and work and empower people as opposed to empower governments. In Africa, the gov our governments are often the problem. They're either corrupt or they're very strong. The last thing we want to do is make them even stronger. So we use technology to give people the power to change the world and the policies around them. Um, we do three things. We ensure that everything we build is citizen-focused. Secondly, that we try and find out what the problems are that keep people awake at night that make them scared for their future or scared for their children's future. And then the things that we can change as well, because not all problems are solvable in the short term and not all problems are solvable with technology or with data. We target those, and but we always make sure that we're very realistic. This is a photograph from the health ministry in Nigeria. That is an official government data archive on patient records and hospital records in a country of over a hundred million people. They came to us and they said, could you help us? Can you turn this into a cell phone app so that people can access hospitals and medicine in a far more, a far easier way than they're currently able to? And this is not an impossible challenge. This is an opportunity that we can use um, to demonstrate the power of the technologies that you've been seeing this morning. So we've got 90 active projects across Africa at the moment. They range from uh, pollution and, and water sensors, like you heard about this morning. They also include um, drones, camera drones, that we use to track um, oil pollution and civil unrest, and then lots of data-driven mobile or internet-based projects. We also have a community of 30,000 people, similar to the ones that you've been hearing from this morning. Technologists, journalists, researchers, academics across Africa who come together in teams to build these kinds of solutions on a voluntary basis. Um, and the re one of the reasons why I'm here in Taiwan and not in Africa today is that because what you've been doing here the last few days can help have impacts right across the world. Um, as one example, uh, about a year and a half ago, GovZero did a presentation in Washington DC at the World Bank about a human OCR project where um, they got thousands of citizens um, to help analyze documents to e extract information. That one project was heard by a colleague of mine in Argentina, in South America, and they used it to build this project called Vozdata which analyzed all of their parliamentary records and tracked the costs of senators um, and exactly how they've been spending, what properties they owned and so forth. And it's resulted in major changes in the government and also in global recognition. In Africa, we're doing similar things. The important thing that we need to understand about data is that on its own, data is boring to most citizens. So we need to find ways of taking data and making it applicable or usable in the lives of ordinary citizens on a daily basis. One project that we've got at the moment that's busy changing the public discussion in South Africa is something called living wages. In most of Africa, even the working class people have household servants. You have nannies, you have chefs, you have people who help clean your house. But they get paid very poor wages. And no one knows how much you really should be paying them because no one knows what you really need to be able to earn, to live, to send your children to school and pay for your health care. 
So what we did was used public data to build a tool and we first told stories about the impacts of underpaying people and how that changes them and turns them, forces them into a life of crime. But then we built a tool, a very simple tool, just running off a spreadsheet that people can use on a cell phone or a website that helps every single person calculate whether they were paying the people who worked in their houses, whether they were paying them a slave wage or if they were paying them a living wage. And underpinning that tool, we had very, very solid, very robust research from economists from Harvard University, um, statisticians from the government agencies who helped build a data model that could not be questioned on a scientific basis. We then revealed that to the public and said, here is the basis that we use. And every single one of the indicators you can personalize. So if the person who is your nanny also lives in your house, then you can zero rate that because then they don't need accommodation. So it's a way of personalizing data and making it real in your lives. The results was tens of thousands of people responding publicly, either pledging to improve or increase the wages that they pay their household work, or reacting and arguing against this as an evil of society. Rather than rejecting that, we then turned the responses into public data as well. We tracked the feedback. And that's helped people analyze and keep the discussion going. So data that started out as public government official data, we then turned into data journalism, which then created citizen data in the responses. And that starts becoming a feedback loop as just one example of a very low cost project. This is another project using very similar approaches in Kenya, again, driven by a spreadsheet on the back end. And this project started to try and help people understand where they could register for the elections, which are very violent in Kenya. 2,000 people died two elections ago um, when this was built. Um, and what it did was just help people to find out where to register. And then once they are registered, to make sure that no corrupt official has changed them into a wrong constituency to cancel out their vote. The electoral authorities in the country said that they saw a very distinct increase in the people of peop uh, number of people registering for the elections. It was so successful that it's now been used by hundreds of thousands of normal citizens in, over, in five countries in Africa, and it's about to be used in Zambia in two months' time. In fact, two of those countries Malawi and Ghana have adopted this tool, which cost us only $500 to build. And they've now accepted it and they're using it as the official government solution in those two countries for voter uh, verification. Here's another one that we have that helps you find out if your doctor is a real doctor, which is we have fake doctors in Africa. So I went, I got sick, I went to a doctor, um, I got sicker with the medicine he gave me. So I flew home to my own country. And we then found out the doctor that I was visiting is a veterinarian. They treat animals, not humans. When I got very upset, they told me not to worry. This happens a lot in Kenya. I must just move on with my life. So we built a very simple tool that on your cell phone with SMS, you can check to see if your doctor is really registered. And it's those kinds of tools, small data, data that is personal, that can change people's lives, that often has the biggest impacts. This is one of the reasons why we do a lot of data work. Because in our countries, inefficiencies and corruption really end up costing people's lives. It's not just about human rights. So we build a lot of background plumbing or infrastructure tools that power um, more public citizen projects. We do the heavy lifting for them. And we do very big, dangerous projects to prove the real-world impacts of this work. So we've mapped out, for example, all of the property earnings and the hidden business of the Italian mafia across Africa. We've actually gone and made it public. We found out if they own diamond mines, they own their own banks, um, their own hotel groups, and they even own office buildings that the government rents from them without knowing that they're the mafia. We're also busy tracking the oil industry in Nigeria, where the government loses $10 billion per year. Um, in taxes that are not paid because the companies are hidden away. So we've managed to use public data to shine a light on that so that the public can get more money and therefore get better services. 
And then we've used the World Bank, for example, we've used their own open data policies to show how World Bank development has displaced three million people across the world. Here we worked as part of an international team with uh, the International Consortium for Investigative Journalists. And finally, um, we're also starting to shine the light on foreign uh, infrastructure developers, so construction companies and mining companies across Africa. In this case, we started with the Australians and how they, um, companies do not imp uh, employ the same labor legislation and safety standards that have led to hundreds of deaths across Africa. Now, those same companies apply much safer standards for Australians in Australia. We're looking at Chinese companies next. So that's just a very quick overview of the kinds of projects that very small data and small amounts of money can do. And the question that you asked me was, how do we make large data real in, in normal people's lives? It's through the smaller projects and some of the fun projects that you saw this morning. Thank you.